Welcome, everybody, to Containers for Beginners. Uh, I'll be your MC for this talk. My name is David Butler. I'm in product marketing at Docker. Uh, but it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce Michael Irwin from Virginia Tech. Michael is um, an application architect, so he's pretty familiar with containers and the IT organization of Virginia Tech. But uh, he's also a Docker captain. He's also a Docker community leader. And I just uh, told him he's also been named uh, Professor of Containers. Uh, so uh, lots to learn here. Um, welcome, Michael. Thanks, David. So, thank you, and uh, good morning, everyone. And I, I fully recognize I stand between you and lunch, and I don't take that responsibility lightly. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have a good time together. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Uh, just curious, do we have any Hokie alum here? All right, there's a couple in the back, awesome. All right, cool. Uh, so Virginia Tech alum. So a couple of disclaimers. Okay, first off, this talk is gonna be a, a technical one-on-one -on -one getting started. So we're gonna be diving into what are containers, what are images, how we should think about them, et cetera. And disclaimer number two, I added this since the keynote, I can't explain sprinkle pods either. So just setting that disclaimer out there. Um, but to get started, I, I want to start off with just a little bit of history, and I, I know uh, Docker CEO Steve Singh talked about this a little bit in the keynote, but it helps set the stage and the context again, so I'll just breeze through this a little bit. But if we think about history and shipping, okay, a long time ago, if I was a goods producer and I wanted to ship goods, I just bundled them in whatever I had, bags, barrels, crates, uh, whatever I had, I'd take my goods down to the dock, they'd load it up on a ship, and then the ship would carry it across the sea to the next market or wherever. And funny enough, ships actually ended up being in dock more often and, and longer than they did while they were actually out to sea actually shipping their goods. Okay? And it's because of such a process of taking goods on and off the ship, loading things in, shoving them in every nook and cranny to maximize the space in the ship, and then get it out to sea, and then, well, taking everything off and now moving things around. And, and so the, the chance of loss and theft was really, really high. Okay? And then the Industrial Revolution came along, and now we've got rail that's moving things much faster across uh, continents and countries, et cetera. And while it worked out really well, we started to see the inefficiencies of moving things from one shipping method to another to another. Uh, and, and so these inefficiencies started to, to really creep in, and people started to notice them. And so eventually somebody said, well, why don't we just standardize around a box, okay? And let's, with this box, just throw whatever you want into it. And as a shipping provider, I can just standardize around this box. I can know that it's gonna be a certain size, it can carry a certain weight capacity so I can stack them so high, et cetera. And I, as a shipping goods provider, I don't have to worry about what's inside the box. Okay. And so if, I want, if I'm a goods producer, I just, again, throw stuff in the box, hand it to the, the shipping company, and it will end up where it needs to go. And so this completely revolutionized shipping, as we saw Steve talk about earlier today. Now, so then the question is, how is software like shipping? And it's, it's very analogous, and, and it's not by accident that we have the name containers. A long time ago, if I wanted to build an app, I had to talk to my uh, sys admins and say, hey, we've got a new app coming up, and they said, great, come back in six weeks, we'll have rack and stack the new server, set up the VMs, install all the stuff you need, and then we'll give you access to it, okay? And for a long time, that was just accepted. That was just the cost of business, okay? And so we would build that in our schedules, and we would have to deal with it. But now we're in a much different environment where it's, how many hours has it been since our last deploy? Okay. And we're wanting to respond to user feedback as quickly as possible, adjust software, fix bugs, whatever, and then get it out the door. Now, if we're still using the old processes and just automating those processes, we're still gaining a lot, sure, but we still see a lot of the inefficiencies in the system. And so that's where Docker and containers really come in, because now we're able to standardize around this box, this container, and by being standardized, now we can build tools and everything on top of that abstraction. Okay. So I'm gonna provide two scenarios here, and depending on if you're dev and ops, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to figure out really quickly based on who's laughing more. One of these two scenarios will probably uh, sound familiar to you. So this first one, I'll give you a second to read it. Okay, I'm hearing a couple of chuckles. 
So, so yeah, as, as a developer, there have been many times in which, hey, here's the repo. I hope the docs are still up to date. You know, install everything on your machine. And you know, as your first commit, go ahead and update the wiki. You know, good job, you've contributed for the day. That's awesome, okay? Um, it, it, it's, it's tough and it's painful. Okay, if, if that didn't quite uh, sound, if you couldn't relate to that, maybe this one does. Um, <laughs> Okay, that one got a much better response. <laughs> so it works, it works fine in dev, and, and if we think about this, what's the problem here? Okay, as a developer, when I develop an application, I'm developing with a particular runtime in mind, whether it's Java or Node or PHP or whatever it is, I have a particular runtime in mind. I've set up that runtime on my machine with all the dependencies, modules, libraries, whatever, but what do I commit in my repo? I only commit the source code Okay? And I leave that environment behind and I expect somehow magically that when I put this on another developer's machine or put it in production, somehow that environment has been magically replicated in the other place. Okay? We, we need some way to move the environment around. Okay? And that's again what, what containers are bringing. So I want to play an imagine if game. And I'm, I'm going I'm to do a demo here. How many people have heard of change root? Okay, so there's a couple. All right. I'm, I'm gonna do a change root demo here, and I think it's, it's really gonna help set the stage for what we're gonna do going forward. So what I've got here is I've, I've just got a, I'm actually running this in an Alpine container, but it doesn't really matter. But I've, I've just got a, an app here, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a new folder that's gonna basically be a, a new root file system for a custom shell I'm gonna make, okay? So inside this directory, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy all of the main, uh, the main bin directory and the main lib directory. So I have all the normal binaries and libraries and everything. And I'm gonna echo um, hello there to dockercon.txt. So I'm just gonna make a file here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna modify this and I'm gonna remove the rm command and the move commands. Okay, and we'll see why here in a second. So I've, I've kinda got this directory, custom binaries and libraries, again, just copied from the, the default collection here, and then I'm gonna do a change root, and say now I wanna start a new shell, and instead of using the root of the, the operating system of the file system here, I want this directory to be my root. And so at this point, now if I do an ls, well, that, that, that's the root that I see. I can no longer see outside of this directory, okay? And since I remove the, the rm command, if I try to remove dockercon.txt, I'm gonna do a quick vote here. How many think this will work? Not a single hand. Okay, there's one, one courageous person up front. Okay, who thinks this won't work? Okay, and how many people think it, or are just undecided, they don't know? Okay, we have a problem here. The sum of those three groups didn't equal the whole. Okay. Um, all right, so let, let's run this, and yeah, it doesn't work. RM is not found. Okay, because in this little custom file system here, it doesn't have the, the remove command. Okay, now this is a pretty, pretty lame demo, I guess I'll say that. But let, let's, let's try something else. So in this other tab here, I'm in that same, uh, same container, so I see that new shell. And when I'm in this app directory, I've got a node.tar.gz, and what I'm gonna do is, let's see if I still have it here, okay. I'm gonna just explode that archive into that new shell directory. And it's adding just a bunch of files, okay? So now let me go back to my custom shell here, and just by expanding that, that tar now, I have node installed, okay? And so I can run node and I can say console log two plus two, and yeah, math works, that's good. And, and so I've got node now in this custom shell, and all I did was expand a tar file, okay? So if I now were to exit out of this, and I say, let me tar up this entire new shell directory and I can share that with you, guess what? That's really what an image is, okay? And we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more. But if I can, again, take this root, custom root file system I just made and share that with you, now you have the exact same environment that I just built and your apps will run the same way as it, it did here, assuming that we're sharing this environment, okay? That's what an image is, okay? So, so creating images. Images, again, are just really, think of them as portable file systems. So just like that demo, if I were to, to tar up that new shell directory and share that with you, think of it that way. We'll dive a little bit deeper here in a few minutes, so. 
So the best practice is to use a Docker file, and a Docker file is just simply a text file that contains various instructions. I'm not gonna go deep into those, there's other talks on uh, building images and whatnot. But the cool thing about it being a text file is now I can keep it in my, my version control system, it can, it can be version controlled, I can share it easily, et cetera. And we build it using Docker build. So this example Docker file here is uh, building a, a Node app. I'm starting from Node, I'm copying in my package JSON which defines my app's dependencies and the yarn lock file which pins those dependencies. And then I'm doing a yarn install to actually do install those dependencies, copy in my source code, and then I specify the command here to say, whenever you run a container using this image, this portable file system that we just make, here's the default command to run. Okay? And we'll see this here in just a second. So once I've built an image, how do I share this image? Okay, cool. Again, just conceptually thinking, if I had this magical tar file that has this, this file system, how do I share it with the world? And the way that you do that is you use registries. Okay, by default, the, the default registry is Docker Hub, but you can run your own registry. You can use the Docker Trusted Registry. You can, there, there are lots of third party offerings. And the uh, screenshot over on the, the right of this, this slide, these are all the current registries part of the CNCF landscape, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So there, there's lots of offerings. If one's not working for you, try another one. Okay. And then once it's shared, once it's in these registry, then other people can pull the image explode it onto their machine or you know, run it as a container and, and make advantage of that environment, okay? So let's, let's build a quick image here. And so what I'm gonna do is this tab over here, let me clear that. Um, actually, let's do this. Okay. So I've got my Docker file here. That's the exact same one that I had in the slide. And so I'm gonna build and I'm gonna tag this as Mike Series 7, my first node image. I'm just gonna put DC19 for DockerCon19. So this is gonna give this new image the name. Tagging is just really giving it a name. And then don't forget the period, it's really easy to forget. Um, it basically says here's, here's the location of the Docker file, here's where all the other files that we're going to include in. Um, so when I'm doing like a copy, where's it pulling those from? Really, I don't know why it doesn't default the period. A lot of times I forget to push that and it'd be nice if it just did that, but. So I do this, I did the build earlier, so it's already cached and it, it goes really quickly here. Um, but now, let me push that image. And since I already pushed it earlier, we, we see it went pretty quickly there. Um, it's, it's all cached. So let me actually go to play with Docker now, and let me make the font size a little bit bigger here so you can see in the back. Bit 24. Okay, so Docker container run, and I'll explain what these are in just a second. So this app runs on port 3000. My first image, node image, DC19. And so since this was a new play with Docker instance, it doesn't have that image, and so it's pulling down the image, and we'll talk about it with all of these different pieces are in just a minute. So to explain the commands real quick, so dash dash rm is gonna clean up my, my local machine when the container exits. And we'll, we'll talk about what things it's cleaning up in just a minute. Um, the dash t and i put me in interactive mode into the, the container, so if I was running a bash, it would put me inside the container in that bash prompt. Um, and dash p exposes the port onto the host machine. I'll talk about why that's important here in a minute. But, uh, and it's not giving me my, my badge up there. Let's see if we can figure this out. Let's see if I get lucky. There it is. Okay. So I got my hello world there. And hey, this this play with Docker instance here. If I go back to it, it, it doesn't have Node installed. Okay, but I just ran a Node app here because again, I just built this little custom file system that we're calling an image. I push it to a registry and then I pulled it down and said, hey, run a container using that, that as the, the root file system for this, this process, okay? Yeah, it worked, okay. And I didn't do my demo god appeasement, so let's, let's hope it keeps working for us. Okay, so what's a container then? If anybody tells you a container is like a VM, just walk away, okay? Especially if it's a vendor, all right? Um, a container is not a VM, 
okay? At the end of the day, a container is just another process on the machine. And I'm gonna repeat that, a container is just another process on the machine, okay? But, it, but it's a process that's, its view of the world has been altered, okay? And the way that it, it, that alteration occurs is by using namespaces, control groups, uh, and some of the, the namespaces I have on here, so network and user and process, IPC, mount, et cetera. There, I think all these namespaces have actually existed for a long, long time, much longer than Docker itself. But what Docker did with the CLI was just make it really, really easy to use these things. Okay, so again, the idea of containers has been around for a long time. Okay. To run a container, we use the Docker container run, which we've seen lots of examples. I just did one as well. And so what, what's actually kind of going on? We've, we've probably seen similar pictures like this before, and I, I've made a slightly modified version of this. Kind of traditionally, the way that we've isolated applications is, is like this. We have the infrastructure, the host OS, and hypervisor. Sure, some of those can be swapped around or merged into a single box or whatever. But at the end of the day, if we wanted to isolate applications because of version differences or whatever, we'd say, well, let's just spin up another VM. Okay? And we got really good at that. There's lots of automation around it. But now if you look at it, now I've got three guest OS's for three apps. And three apps that may only be getting 10% utilization. Okay? And now I have to manage three kernels, three memory managers, three systems that have to be patched and everything. That's a lot of overhead just to isolate three apps. So then what containers allow us to do is, again, since they're just processed on the machine, now we can basically bin pack more onto each machine. And namespaces are what, what give us the boundaries. Now, if you search around the internet, and I argue with people all the time about this, there's, there are examples of this image that have, I hope, yeah, you can see my mouse there, that have another layer on top of operating system that's, that many people label as container engine. And I think that's a terrible diagram because it gives the perception that the container engine sits between the app and the underlying infrastructure, okay? And that's not true. Okay. The, the container engine is not doing any kind of syscall translations or doing anything. Once, once the container starts, it's, it, again, just another process on the machine. So the Docker daemon is yet another process on the machine that when you tell it to run a container, it just starts the process, sets up all the namespaces and everything, but then it's pretty much out of the way. Okay. So just remember that. Some caveats with this is me means if all the containers that you have on the same machine are, yes, sharing the same kernel, okay? And there are, so if you have kernel level vulnerabilities, you, okay, a break in in one container, if, it's, if you're taking kernel level uh, vulnerabilities, could gain access to other containers on the same machine, okay, depending on what the vulnerabilities. So just be aware of that, um, but for the most part, there have been very, very, very few container escape mechanisms and even the, the many years that containers have been around, okay? But it's still something to be aware of. So, I put this up here. So my wife actually made this for me a week ago and she knows nothing about containers but she took this picture, this is my daughter, um, and, so, and she made this, I'm like, that, that's gold. You actually do listen to some of the nerd stuff I talk about. And, uh, and so she made this and I was like, I've gotta fit this into the slide deck. But containers, Again, it's, it's a, this idea that I'm just creating a portable file system and shipping it around it and sharing it with people. Okay. So uh, you probably saw that when I pushed the image and when I pulled it onto the Play With Docker, let's see if I still have it. You see that it's pulling all these different layers. Okay. What are all those layers? Each of those layers simply represents a, a set of file system changes. Okay, a, a set of file system changes in relation to the parent layer, okay? And each of the layer's file system changes are represented as a single tar, and I'll actually show that to you here in just a minute. And every command in a Docker file will produce another layer. So you need to be careful of the commands that you put in, we'll, we'll see an example of that here in just a minute. One cool utility that you can use is the Docker image history command. And what that does is it actually tells you, here are all the layers in this image, Plus, here's the command that was used to, to create this specific layer. When we think about the layers, when those layers are, are being put together to run in a container, it's, Docker is using what's called a union filed system. Has anybody heard of a union filed system before? Okay, so there's maybe five hands, okay? And honestly, I hadn't heard of it much, and again, this is another construct that's been around for a long, long time. 
but containers really uh, brought another valid use case to it. So if I have all these layers, the container is running in the merge layer. It's basically taking all these layers, union, merging them all together, and higher layers replace files found in lower layers. So in this example, layer two has file two and file five. Well, layer one also had file two, but since layer two is a higher layer, the, the version of file two found in layer one is, isn't seen in the container, okay? So again, higher layers replace lower layers. So then the question is, how do you, how did deleted files get represented in the structure and, and layers? So if I had a, another command in my Docker file that said, hey, remove this file, how does that get represented? And it works very much the same, you know, same way we do on paper. It uses what's called a whiteout file, okay? If I write something on paper and with a pen, I realize, oh man, I, I didn't mean to, it's the wrong date, let me get out some whiteout and I just cover it up. It's basically the same idea here. So in layer three, if I were removing a file, if I actually look at that, that layer's tar file, I would have a zero length file that's just named .wh.file4, and it's a whiteout file. And so then when the union file system puts these all together, the final container doesn't see that file four existed. Okay, but what's interesting to note is that while well, file four is still in layer one, once a layer is created, it can't be modified. And so that's why we're creating another layer with the whiteout files. But that means I'm still shipping around layer four, or the, sorry, I'm still shipping around file four even though I'm not using it all. Okay, so that's an important thing to remember. In fact, warning, be careful what you put in your images, okay? Deleted files aren't actually gone. All right, so I'm gonna do a demo here. Uh, let's go to this tab. What I have on the top is I'm, I'm gonna be in a, actually, let's do this one, yeah. Um, I had a container that I just called the mystery image. And if we look at the image history, we could see, all right, hey, there's a node version and I'm command node. Okay, so this is some node-based application. It's using um, APK, so it's probably Alpine-based. And, oh, interesting, I see in this layer here that I'm doing npm install and remove some file, but it's getting cut off. Okay. If you wanna see the full command, you use the no trunk flag. And I find it completely ironic that you truncate the no trunk flag. Okay, <laughs> uh, whatever. So, <laughs> so if, if we run that, it gets really long because there's some of the commands are much longer and it's word wrapping them all. But if we look at it, we can see, hey, there's this command that's doing an npm install and remove this app source settings.js. Okay, if I actually run the container, uh, mystery image, just start a shell, and if I look in the source directory, I don't see that settings.js file. So it is indeed gone from my container, but so what, what can I do? There's another command, docker image save, mystery image, in which, th what this is gonna do, it's gonna create a, a tar file that has all the, the layers bundled in it, and it streams it to standard out so you can save it to a file or whatever. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just pipe it to, to tar and just immediately explode it back out. And this will take a second to run. The, the use case for this might be if I create an image and I want to take the image and put it onto an air gap network or something like that, I can put it onto a, a USB drive, carry it over to the other machine, and now load that image from there. But if I look at this, now I see a bunch of directories and I see this manifest.json. If I look at the manifest.json, it actually tells me here's the repo tags, here's all the layers in this image and everything. Okay, now this is getting super nerdy, I know. But if I look at the layer that removed that file, okay, that was in the last command. So if I go in the previous uh, layer where that file was added, Let's actually go in there, and I'm going to unpack that tar file, app, source, and now I've got that settings.js file, and so here's the file that got deleted in my image, okay? And so, all right, I've got, oh, settings, db user equals root and db pass secret that shouldn't be seen, okay? So some developer was like, oops, I didn't mean to actually copy that in there, let me put another run command to delete that file, I don't see it in the final container, must be good enough, ship it, okay? No, okay. 
you never, ever, ever want to bake secrets or, or any files that you don't want in your final image in previous layers because they're not actually gone. They're just being whited out. Okay? And I, I, I'm quite confident that there are bots that are just crawling Docker Hub, pulling images, looking through all the layers and looking for AWS secrets, TLS certificates, any database credentials, whatever. So you never, ever, ever want to bake your secrets into files, even if you remove them. Okay? So be aware of that. Okay. So two best practices real quick. So clean up as you go. As I talked about earlier, every command in a Docker file is, is creating a, another layer. So in this example, we're creating an image that had, that's producing the AWS CLI. You know, pretty basic. I've got four commands, one that's uh, getting all the repo, cache, or repo indexes from APT. I'm going to install Python on pip. I'm going to install the AWS CLI using pip. And then, I, you know, I don't need pip in my final image, so let's remove it. Okay. But what we just learned is that when I remove pip, all I'm doing is creating a bunch of whiteout files. So I'm still shipping pip even though I'm not actually using it in the final container. So the way to fix this is to chain all, of, all of this into a single run to say, well, I'm going to do my update. I'm going to install Python and pip. I'm going to install my AWS CLI. I'm going to clean things up. And the last command is actually cleaning up those, uh, the repository indexes. Okay? And what this ends up doing, just this simple change, my final container looks the exact same. And what it does is it reduces my image size from 512 meg to 183 with a 64% reduction, okay? So again, it's just thinking about what am I actually putting into each of my layers? What, do I really want this or not? And in fact, actually, I looked at the, the auto remove command where, where I'm actually uninstalling pip, and there's 1.2 megabytes of just zero content length files, okay? That's a lot of whiteout files for nothing, really, okay? I didn't need to ship that in the first place. So clean up as you go. Another best practice I'll just tell you is keep your images tight and focused. Only install the things that you want. It's really easy when you're getting started with containers to say, I'm used to general purpose VMs, I'm gonna make a general purpose container that can do everything, okay? That's not the point. Remember, the point is to make a file system that's specifically tailored to run a specific app, a specific process. In this particular example, I've got a React front end, and so I, in order to build this React app, I need Node. And so I'm going to use a node container. I'm doing a package, installing all my dependencies and everything, running a yarn build. And for those of you not familiar with React, the end result is just static HTML, JavaScript, CSS. Okay? I don't need node to actually serve that content, so why don't I use a container and, a, and an application that's designed to serve static content like Nginx? So this is an example of a multi-stage build where I, I use node to do my build, but then I use Nginx to actually serve my app and I, I pull the, the contents of the build into another container. You can do the same thing with Java. I'm gonna use a, my first stage, an image that has a JDK in it with Maven or whatever else, Gradle, whatever you're using. And then my second stage, well, I don't need a JDK in production, I just need a JRE in Tomcat or Wildfly or whatever you're using. And so in my second stage, I'm gonna pull the war file that I produced in the first stage and put it into my final image. And so then again, this allows your final images to be tight and focused. Okay, that's reduced attack vector, reduced uh, maintenance that you have to do on your image. Okay, so use multi-stage builds to separate build time, runtime, runtime dependencies, and there, there are some other talks here at DockerCon to, to dive deeper into that as well, especially build kit. Uh, so that's something to look at. So how do you persist data? That's a question I get quite often. All right, I start this this container, I spin it up, I do something, I tear it down, I start it again, and now it started from scratch. How, how do I persist data? And the answer is to use volumes, okay? So volumes provide the ability to persist or supply data into containers. If we go back to our file system idea that we were talking about earlier, okay, the, the root file system's coming from the image. But then I can augment it and say, all right, here are other, other sources of data coming from the host or a network store or whatever. Built into the Docker engine, there's only two types of volumes. Technically, there's a third, but not many people use a third one anymore. Um, there's bind mounts, in which I'm saying I want to bind this specific directory to this specific spot in the file system. And then there are name volumes where I say, I don't really care where the data's stored, just make sure it's stored. Kind of just think of it as a, it's a bucket. And as long as I use that, that volume, that same name, it's going to refer to the same bucket. 
Okay? And again, these are the only two that are built in, but there are lots of volume drivers if you're using NetApp or, or whatever. Uh, SFTP, I don't know why you necessarily want to use that in a container, but you can. Okay? Um, at Virginia Tech, we've got a NetApp storage array, and so for our production clusters, we've got a volume driver that lets me say, I want to create a volume that's backed by NetApp, and it just works. It's awesome. Okay. So I'm going to do just a quick demo on volumes here, and where's my mouse? Okay. So up top, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a... Um, I'm going to run a Ubuntu container. I'm just going to mount my home data directory and put it into data on the, uh, into the container. And so if I echo hi there to dockercon.txt again, and if I go onto my root machine in that data directory, up, I guess I didn't finish cleaning up from uh, when I was practicing earlier, but I still see that dockercon.txt file, and it's still there. Okay. Now if I remove hi.txt, whatever, I'll see that it's been removed. So it's, it's, it's a bind mount here. Changes in one is, are being changed in the other. Now if I exit this container and I restart the container, okay, I won't make you all vote because it didn't work last time, but you know, will, will the file still be there? And the answer is, well, yes, because those are being persisted on the host. Okay? And so that's, again, you want to use volumes to persist data. And for the cluster environments, remember that the defaults are local volumes. So if I'm running a um, running a container that's using a local volume, that's local to that node. So if you're running in a cluster environment, you you definitely would want to figure out how can I, what network storage provider should I be using to get those off of the node, so all the nodes can share the same volumes. So yeah, good luck remembering all the options. Uh, there's lots of flags, lots of everything. And uh, to tell somebody, hey, here's a command, go run it, good luck, that's, that's a lot to remember. And so Docker came up with Docker Compose. It's a YAML file structure that makes it easy to define these applications and share them with others. Typically, they're seen in project source repos at, at the, the root of the repo. So a lot of times I'll clone a repo, I'll see a Compose file, and I can just use Docker Compose to spin everything up. The tool is bundled with Docker Desktop for, for Mac and Windows. If you're using Docker on Linux environments, you have to install it separately, but it's, it's not too hard to do. And one thing to just mention, so Docker Compose relies heavily on networking. I, I'm not going to go into networking, there are other talks on it, but think of networking really in terms of communication boundaries and isolation. If two containers are on the same network, they can talk to each other. If they're not on the same network, they can't talk to each other. Um, and that's the Unless you're a network engineer and you learn about VETH ETH pairs and, and all that kind of stuff, I, I won't get into it, but if they're the same network, they can talk to each other. And one of the really cool things is Docker basically puts itself in as the DNS resolver for the containers. So if I have two containers, I have an app and database, and I specify that my database has an alias of DB, my app just simply has to say, I want to connect to a host named DB. And Docker says, well, great, yeah, I have a service in that same network that's named DB. Let me resolve the IP address to that container. And it, it just does it. So my app doesn't have to figure out how do I find it. All I need to know is a host name. And so as apps or containers come and go, Docker's DNS is keeping that all up to date, which is really awesome. All right, so I'm going to do a quick Compose demo here. And I'm going to go back to Docker Compose here and, or sorry, play with Docker. And I'm going to clone a repo that I have here. And I'm going to just spin this up. And while it's doing that, I'll show you what it's actually doing. So I have a Docker Compose file that it's, it's two things. There's an app, it's a PHP app. This is just a simple LAMP stack. And it's going to build a container to use for the app image, and it's going to expose the port. And I'm mounting in my source directory to the web root. And then my database, it's going to build a database. Really, it's just using upstream MySQL and adding a, a schema file to it, so it'll automatically create the schema. And that, that's really it. Okay. And at this point, let me go back here. Go to port 80. All right, so my... And now I've got my grocery list application. I, I was tired of making to-do lists, so I just made a grocery list. And so now I can add milk, and it, it stores in the database. Hooray. Now, since, since I have mounted my source directory in, what I can do is I can, I can make changes to it. And I'd say, you know, this, 
the submit button's not exciting enough, so let's make it super exciting. And if I save that file and go over here and just refresh, now my submit button's super exciting. Okay, so again, I, I'm just mounting the source code in there, and as a developer, I don't have to know how to set up my environment, I just run Docker Compose up, and it just works. Okay, and I can start contributing day one. Uh, on our team, we had developers in the past, when we would hire new developers, we'd, we would fully expect the first week was just setting up your machine, getting everything installed. Now we're at the point that, hey, you got in today, you're committing code by the end of the day. Okay, sure, it may not be real good code yet because they don't know the, the application architecture and everything, but they at least have the ability to do so. Okay, because all they have to do is spin it up and go. So Docker and Compose, fantastic for developers. Okay. So let's talk about orchestration for a minute. Just got a couple more minutes left. Orchestration, if we go back to the idea of standardizing around these shipping containers, this is another one of the tools that builds on top of this, con this container standard. It, think of it kind of as a traffic controller. I have a fleet of machines and I can just simply say, hey, I want this to work and it says, all right, cool, I'll make it happen. And the way that it works, and pretty much every orchestration framework works this way, you define the expected state, which you want to happen, the desired state, and then the system works really hard to make actual state reflect what you want to happen. Okay, so if I say I want three replicas of this, it'll say, great, let me figure out where I can put those across the cluster. Okay, and I don't have to go to each individual machine and actually start it up. And the actors in orchestration, there's typically only two types of actors. There's the managers, who are the brains of the operations. These are the ones that I tell the expected state. And then there are the workers that actually go and do the work. Okay, in some environments, some orchestration frameworks, managers can be workers too. So just recognize that as well. And so the workers go and actually do the work. Now managers in some systems may be called masters, workers may be agents or nodes, but it's the pretty much all the same, same types of actors in every uh, orchestration framework. Just really high level, okay, these are the three I'm, I'm just gonna hit on. So Docker Swarm, we saw some examples of this morning. It's shipped with the container engine, you install Docker, you get the ability to run Swarm. It's super user friendly, it's easy to get up and going and satisfies most needs. And Kubernetes is super extensible, but it is super complicated, okay? And you that's why there are so many managed services out there for it, because it's hard to do, okay? But you can do a lot of really cool stuff with it. Amazon ECS, we use that quite a bit, it's their Elastic Container Service, and it has a lot of deep integrations with the AWS, as well as EKS, but um, we do a lot with ECS as well. So let's actually spin up a quick swarm. So going back to play with Docker, what I'm gonna do is increase my font size again. So Docker Swarm init, and because this is on uh, Play With Docker, I have to specify an advertise address. And I'm just gonna copy this command, go to my, hello. What is it actually copying here? Sometimes the uh, copy and paste part gets a little funky. All right. So copy that, paste there. And now at this point I've got a node cluster. I've got a three node cluster and all I did was just run three commands. And now all I have to do is say, let me actually create a service here. I'm gonna name it cats and replicas three. And I want it to run Mike series seven cats 1.0. And so I'm defining this expected state here. And now this cluster is gonna figure out where it can run. And for kicks, I'm going to install, I've got a Docker app, which we saw quite a few demos of this morning, which will show me, once it starts up, where things are, are across the cluster. And so I can see that it, it started up this app across the cluster. And if I open up, Oops, I forgot to publish the port. But anyways, I, I can define the expected state and say I want this going, and it says great, let me figure this out. Now if I um, docker service update, and let me publish add 5000, and I'm also gonna change the image to version 2.0. Oops. 
what we'll see is we'll see it roll out an, a new update. And if I start looking at it now, once it starts up, it's rolling out the update, the version 2.0, and my cat's image version 2.0 is actually dogs because dogs are better. So, um, so there you go, it just displays a random GIF there, but we can see it rolling out across the cluster. So, again, swarm and orchestration really give me the ability to kind of traffic control across my cluster. And so containers and images, again, to recap, are just the standard way to app, package up an application. I no longer need to do a lot of host config other than just install the engine. Um, and Docker Compose and orchestration are, again, tools that build upon this, this standardization. We need to be mindful of how we build our images and volumes allow us to persist our data. Okay. One thing I'll just end on, containers are not a silver bullet to change your company culture. Going back to the idea of the Industrial Revolution, that happened because people wanted to make goods faster, they produce goods faster, they ship them faster. If, if you're having a struggle just being agile and, and responding to user feedback, containers aren't gonna fix that, okay? There's, there's a whole cultural adoption that has to occur along with that, okay? And that, that's honestly the hardest part, okay? So work on your culture, work on the ability to, to move quickly. And with that, I thank you. I encourage you to rate the session too. Give me feedback on what worked, what didn't, and I'd be happy to, to respond from there. Um, Excellent, and what a great, great overview. Um, in the app on the phone, you can rate the presentation. That would be great. Um, I think Michael may hang around. He's going to take a selfie for any quick questions. Uh, but we are definitely out of time. So uh, thanks for everybody for coming. Enjoy lunch. Another <laughs> round for Michael. <laughs>